Good morning, good morning, and indeed good morning to you all. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thomas, keeping up your winning streak of being the first comment uh, on, uh, on, on these little lessons. Very, very good. I don't know how you do it. You must have fingers like lightning. Bravo, sir. Welcome back, everybody. How are we? Good to have you all here. Ethan and Jamie, welcome back. Lovely to have you here. Hello, Izzy. How are you? Welcome back. Lovely to have you. I can see that the uh, the Gannies have turned up. I was about to say, Ethan and Jamie, where on earth were you on Monday? Um, I was very shocked and alarmed. I very nearly put out a uh, a missing persons ad, but don't worry, it's wonderful to have you back. Grandma Bell has joined. Welcome, Grandma Bell. Lovely to have you here. Um, hello to the Gannies. Lovely to see you. I think I can see uh, Nonna lurking in the doorway. Come on in, pull up a pew, pens and papers out. Jamie's birthday on the 9th. Oh, 9th birthday on Friday. I do apologise. How exciting. We all have to have a celebration. Uh, looking forward to that. Hi, Leo. Welcome. Good to have you here. I saw Ian hurtling through the classroom door there. Welcome, Ian. Lovely to have you all here. <clears throat> Excusez-moi. Oh, very appropriate. Now, I believe that we had a birthday yesterday, unless I am very much mistaken. Um, and so who, who, whoever's birthday it was yesterday, please sing out. I mean, give you a rousing chorus of happy birthday. Well, I'll give you a couple of notes. I won't bore you all with my terrible singing. Um, but whoever had a birthday yesterday, please do sing out. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Lovely to see we've got some new people joining today, which is awfully exciting. Maybe that is because of the calibre of the person we are talking about today, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, by the end of the lesson, I want all of your views, <clears throat> excuse me, as to whether he was Napoleon the Great, um, a title that he hasn't been bestowed, uh, even in France. I mean, he's very much respected in France, funnily enough, but, uh, and we'll discuss the reasons why. But no, we don't often hear the word Napoleon the Great, do we? I wonder why that is. We've got lots of people joining and waving. Hi there, everybody. I, I can't wave back, otherwise I'll, um, I'll uh, whatever the word is, but hello there. Do sing out. I think that's, uh, I think we've got Stuart there. Hello, Stuart. Welcome. Uh, we'll give it another minute or so. Hello, Harry. Lovely to see you here. Wonderful. Welcome back, Harry. Um, yes, Napoleon. Uh, that, that great man. Um, for better, for worse, he was a great man. Uh, and one thing I do want to uh, uh, clear up here, ladies and gents, is that he was not small by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that was an English... Um, what's the word, an English creation, propaganda, to poke fun at Napoleon that he was very, very short. He wasn't. <clears throat> he was five foot seven, uh, which for the time was an average height for uh, a man in the 17 and 1800s. So yes, that was a, a bit of English propaganda that we've busted there, that Napoleon was short. He was not short. He, was, well, he, he wasn't particularly tall, but only by our standards at the time, he was, as I say, average height. Hello, Michelle. Welcome. Lovely to have you here. Pull up a pew. Pens and paper out for the quiz. Um, got a rather exciting subject today, as you can tell by my buoyant mood. Um, Napoleon is a jolly, interesting subject, uh, a chap whose actions changed Europe and indeed the world, because uh, he was quite the figure. So I think we can probably launch into our lesson now. Uh, as you know, we have no issues with people arriving late, but, um, you know, if you, uh, if, if, People, if we're waiting for people, there are some favourites who haven't turned up yet, but that's absolutely fine. I've uh, got some favourites who have turned up, which is absolutely marvellous. OK, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off with the lesson. If you can believe it, we are up to lesson 20 uh, in these little forays into historical madness. Uh, 20 lessons. I can't quite believe it. And you're all still here. And you're not sitting in a corner rocking um, backwards and forwards and uh, going, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? So yes, lesson 20. Um, we have the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. Harry, it was your birthday yesterday. Of course it was. And uh, a very happy birthday to you, sir. Um, you share a birthday with Florence Nightingale, which is quite a person to share a birthday with. Um, and on your birthday, something that relates to today's lesson happened and something that was just quite marvellous happened. In 1797, Napoleon conquered Venice uh, on your birthday, Harry. 
So you know, that's something to be uh, quite impressed with. Um, you know, you probably only asked for a card, but Napoleon got you Venice. Hope that was okay. And also in 1937, King George VI was crowned uh, king and emperor, which is jolly exciting as well. Nothing exciting happened on my birthday. Um, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, died uh, on my birthday, but that's about it, really. Uh, but a very happy birthday, Harry. I hope you had a wonderful and very special day. Um, so, yes, the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, now, weighty subject, meaty subject, absolutely. But really, it's quite simple as to why he got to where he was and to why he ended. He got to where um, he was because he took advantage of a nasty situation and uh, he ended up where he was because he was arrogant, overstretched himself and took on far too many enemies. So, as you know, we always start with things to remember. Always like to put a little roll on the R there. Anyone who joined the French Revolution knows that we left off there with Napoleon uh, taking control of the situation, which he was very good to do. Now, the, the word revolution, as we know, um, means a complete revolt, like to go around. Um, and it can also mean a revolution, as in, wow, this is amazing and fantastic. But the French Revolution is a revolution in the first way. So they started off with uh, an autocrat, um, a man who had total power and didn't share it. They went through uh, 180 when they ended up with a Republican, um, you know, sort of very scary Republic um, mentality that they had at the time, very scary and dangerous at the time. And then by the end of it, they ended up right back where they started with an autocrat with all the power and sharing it with nobody. So it really is a revolution in its purest sense. If you look up revolution in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, it'll have the meaning uh, of going in a full revolution. A wheel revolves around. Da, 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 da. So the French Revolution had left France broken and totally disorganised. As you remember at the end of it, they were just killing each other left, right and centre. Uh, guillotine and, and all that sort of stuff and heads on sticks and everything. It was all quite awful. The reign of terror and the re revolution itself had claimed the lives of over 40,000 people during its course, this terrible, bloody course. Um, France was totally disorganised and surrounded by enemies. The monarchies of Europe saw what was happening in France as this terrible, this, this cancerous thing that needed to be cut out as soon as possible. So France was at war with pretty much everybody uh, at this stage in the game. Surrounded by enemies, no central organisation. Um, it was being ruled by a body called the Directorate, D-I-R, Direct, D-I-R-E-C-T-O-R-A-T-E, -E, the Directorate. <coughs> I do apologise, got a frog in the throat. Ribbit. Um, the Directorate was a five-man body um, that was ruling France at the time. It was weak. It was unable to solve the many problems that France was facing at this time. And basically, it had stalled. And France, in turmoil, needed someone to take over. So let's meet the man of the moment, that average height gentleman who was born on the 15th of August, 1769. So before the revolution, obviously, because he took part in said revolution. And he was born on the island of Corsica. Now, Corsica at the time was owned by France. And I think it may be still, actually, on reflection. Um, but yes, he, he wasn't born as a French national. He was born under French law as a Frenchman, but he was born on the island of Corsica. A couple of hellos here. We've got Monica, we've got Max, and we've got Charlie. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, Napoleon was a smart kid. He was a smart cookie. Uh, we've spoken about several people in the past, these great men theories, um, who weren't so smart. Churchill, for example, and uh, etc. But no, he was a smart cookie, and he loved to read. He was a student of history, which is why I think that he and I would have got along rather well over a gin and tonic when he's finished uh, conquering all of Europe. Oop, spoiler alert. Yes, of course, he was born on the 15th of August... 1769, Thomas, and indeed his brother. I hope that that's helpful. On the island of Corsica. Um, his family was very, very large and relatively wealthy. They weren't sort of super rich, 
um, but they were they were sort of all right. You know, they, they had a bob or two, I think is the word. Now, what singled Napoleon out? And I'm not saying this as an historian. I do mean it in all sincerity. An understanding of history singled out Napoleon. He wasn't radical. He wasn't hugely into changing the world in his youth. He didn't have that belief that Churchill had that he would single-handedly change the world. He was a very middling individual. He was smart, but he wasn't phenomenal. But he loved history and he loved the military. And Napoleon won a scholarship to go to military school. And this set him on his course to greatness. Um, little fun fact for you, one of my little favourite facts about uh, dear old Boney, was that despite the fact that he ended up one day, spoiler alert, becoming Emperor of France, he didn't learn to speak French until he was 10 years old. So he was born, as I say, on Corsica, and he grew up majoritively speaking Corsican and Italian. And as I say, for a, uh, a French emperor to not only not have a father who was a monarch before him, but also not brought up in his early years speaking French, I think that's quite an interesting little tidbit for you. So 10 years old, baby Napoleon couldn't speak French, um, and he learnt it at the age of 10. Um, now, Napoleon, as I say, he went off, he went to military school and he learnt his ways and he used the madness of the French Revolution in order to rise through the ranks um, and he did incredibly well. By 1793, uh, he was a brigadier general at the age of 24. Now, I am in my late fifties, and uh, I'm nowhere near becoming a, a brigadier general. I can barely spell brigadier, let alone anything else. But that does demonstrate this innate ability that Napoleon had. I mean, he, he learnt his ways, obviously, but then by the age of 24, to become a brigadier general high up in the French army, it's rather impressive, I always think, anyway. In 1798, an army under the control of the new brigadier general uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. He went, um, what language did he grow up? Yes, no, he, but he learnt the native dialect of Corsican. So he spoke Corsican and Italian. He didn't speak French from birth, um, which I always think is rather interesting. Um, so yes, yeah, 1798, an army under the control of the new uh, brigadier general Napoleon uh, was sent off to do what the French have been doing well for a thousand years, and that is annoying the British. Um, as you know, Britain had uh, India under its control at this point, and a major uh, way of getting there overland was through Egypt. So the French army went under Napoleon to Egypt in order to stop trade to and from um, India. You're more than welcome, don't you worry at all. I am 30, yes, thank you. Um, so yes, this army went to, this is worth knowing, okay, um, went to Egypt in order to stop trade from Britain to India and India to Britain. As we know, Britain had all of its wealth and power from its trade, more, than, uh, more so than its army. Now, Napoleon was there to sort of fight the British in Egypt and fight the native Egyptians. He totally failed in this. It's one of the few occasions when Napoleon really got it wrong. Um, his army and navy were destroyed by the British. And he then had, he was recalled uh, in shame, if you like, uh, as a general to go back to France to answer for what had happened. It was supposed to be a nice, easy little war in Egypt and he got it completely wrong. It turned out, though, that his being called back to France at that time was absolutely perfect. Couldn't have timed it better if he'd tried. In 1799, the anger of the French people at this directorate, who were doing nothing to help the financial situation, the fact that the borders were swarming with German, Prussian, Austrian um, forces, all intent on destroying France, um, they were furious that, direct, that the directorate was sitting around doing nothing and it exploded. This anger exploded outwards and Napoleon grabbed hold of that momentum and he, he overthrew the directorate and he was in power. Napoleon had his first foot 
on the slippery ladder of power. Now, as I said, he was a student of history. He loved the classics. He liked to look back and learn, as we all on this live video like to do. You cannot connect the dots looking forward, people. You can only connect them looking backwards. So Napoleon took on this persona of uh, the great Roman Republic. And you can't argue with that, right? I mean, the Romans were phenomenal. For better, for worse, they did the job well. So he took on this title, and anyone who was with me during the uh, Julius Caesar episode, if you missed it, it's over on Up All Hours' YouTube channel, as are all of these lessons, if you ever want to come back and watch. Um, he took on the title of First Consul, C-O-N-S-U-L, First Consul of France. Now, that was an incredibly Roman Republican title. He was a blooming clever man, was Napoleon. He was using history to make his position stronger. So he was first consul. He made himself first consul of France in 1799. And so, as I say, Napoleon was in power. This was the beginning of it all. Um, and he was extremely popular. Um, I'll have a quick slurp of the old coffee here because my throat's going a bit. Hello there. Hello, Poppy. Poppy, I can't remember your name. Do sing out and let me know what your name is. Um, yes, so Napoleon was an incredibly popular consul. Um, political position, he had power. He wasn't totally independent in his power at this point, but, you know, pretty much there, you know, with a title like that. He did what you have to do in these scenarios. You make friends with people who used to be your enemy. As you know, in the French Revolution, they got, re got rid of religion. The revolution became the religion. There was no uh, Protestantism, Catholicism, da 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 da, da. This was officially, um, what's his name, Napoleon's uh, attempt to make things okay with the Catholic Church. Um, and so he set about fixing France. He made things okay with the Catholic Church because the people love religion, uh, especially uh, if you uh, have been denied it for all of the revolution and you're being forced to, to worship some, this idea that someone in your lifetime wrote down on a piece of paper. No, 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 no. People want to look upwards and see the shining lights of God and, and buy into that. And, uh, you know, they were very happy with Napoleon. He was being very, very clever. People assume that Napoleon was just a military figure with a chip on his shoulder, um, aiming to rise up to become dictator of France. I mean, he was, but he was pretty good at getting stuff done. Louis, of course. Hello, Louis. Welcome. Lovely to have you here. Um, and he did do good things along the way. He did some pretty bad things. He made it incredibly difficult uh, for women in France to have any rights whatsoever, rights that they had before the revolution, Napoleon stripped them off. But he did do some good things. Um, and we won't go into them now because that'll take a long time. But essentially, he was a dictator, people. And this is his second step on that ladder in his dictatorial rule. In 1802, he made himself first consul for life. Now, who does that remind you of? Do you remember we talked about dictators in ancient Rome uh, and how they would make themselves di a dictator for life? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much where Napoleon was getting his source of power from. If in doubt, if any of you decide to go out there and, uh, you know, become a first consul or indeed an emperor or empress, um, do remember um, that you've always got to try and have history on your side. Dictators across the world have used history to support their position usually for worse. I was about to say for better, for worse. Usually for the worse. Um, I can't really think of any good dictators at this stage in the game. I'm sure there's someone out there who was better than the rest, but not really. So 1802, he um, made himself consul for life. And then to complete the wheel, that 360 wheel we discussed in 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican middling military man, crowned himself emperor in Notre Dame de Paris. Um, so he's done it. He's done it. He's up on that ladder now. And he crowned himself with laurel wreaths. Uh, again, that famous uh, image of imperial Rome. And in order to make himself more valid as emperor, because again, 
he was a clever, clever man. He knew how to work the system. In order to make himself valid in the eyes of the people, he actually went to Rome and kidnapped the Pope, Pope Pius VII, in order to have the Pope as the official religious representative at his self-coronation at Notre Dame. He kidnapped poor old Pope Pius VII and dragged him to Paris uh, in order to have him officiate over his coronation. How tall was he? He was five foot seven, I am. Now, everyone thinks that he, that, that he was short. That's propaganda. He was actually average height for the time. Something I'd like you to do after this lesson. If you can jump on Google and look up David, D-A-V-I-D-E, David, uh, he painted Napoleon's coronation. It's called Le Sacré de Napoleon. But if you type in the coronation of Napoleon, it will come up, David. And what's so important, David was not a fan of Napoleon by this point. And in the painting, the light that's streaming down through... Um, through the cathedral windows, isn't falling on this new emperor of France. It's falling on the Pope. The Pope is the central figure in that painting. And I have to say, it is a phenomenal piece of work. It's huge. So yes, please do look up after the lesson, David's Le Sacré de Napoleon, the coronation of Napoleon. Now things are good for Napoleon. He's done all right. He's got a promotion. He's got another promotion. He's sitting on top of the world, Ma. But where do we go from here? Uh, there's no denying Napoleon was a very, very clever man. Uh, his original use of those Republican titles have been pushed aside to take up this imperial Roman image, which is also clever because don't forget the, um, the Republic, the Roman Republic moved into an empire very, very easily. And he, you know, he was using, as I say, history on his side, always. Um, and there's no denying the Roman Empire was phenomenal. So he was then saying, well, why not? Why can't the French Empire be phenomenal? So, yeah, as I say, he was quite clever. Um, and he wasn't all bad. He created a fair-ish society within his empire. As I say, uh, women suffered horrendously uh, when it came to rights under Napoleon. But relatively speaking, um, you know, the other half of the population did OK. And he modernised France, which was desperately needed. So internally, everything was sort of going all right. France was sort of looking around going, I say, we've come out of this rather bon. bon. That's, that's French for good, isn't it? Bon. We've come out of this rather bon. And they were quite happy. However, Napoleon had a huge plan for France. He wasn't happy with a big empire. He wanted the biggest empire that the world had ever seen. Um, as we know, France had overseas territories, but he wanted everything, absolutely everything. He wanted, and he very nearly got it, he wanted to conquer all of Europe, he wanted to take over the United Kingdom, and he wanted to create this vast from sea to shining sea, to uh, quote the Americans, um, French Empire. Um, and he was a military man. If anyone was going to get it done, it was Napoleon, right? I mean, he was trained, he was hugely popular, and he used that popularity to build an enormous French army, something that the world hadn't seen. And the army was entirely loyal, not to France, but to Napoleon himself. And there are two reasons as to why, and I'd like you to remember these. The first one was that Napoleon was one of them. He was a soldier. He'd gone up through the ranks and he knew what it was like to be a soldier. That's the reason, one, that his army was so loyal to him. Number two, Napoleon always, or generally, fought with them. He, we know that he was present at over 60 battles personally. He oversaw 60 battles with his army and they were so loyal. When his second wife, Josephine, bought a new dress that Napoleon didn't like, he would spill wine on the dress and when his wine ran out, he would pretend to write a letter and spill ink on it. What a wonderfully interesting fact, uh, Izzy. Congratulations, have a team point. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to tell my friends about that. But do, that, that's honestly fantastic stuff. I've left out his personal life because, you know, it's rather tricky. Um, but yes, so uh, the army was entirely loyal to Napoleon and Napoleon alone because he was one of them. 
and because he fought with them. Well worth remembering. And just to give you an idea of how amazing his military capabilities were, in 1806, he completely wiped out the Holy Roman Empire, which had been around forever. Uh, the idea of a world without the Holy Roman Empire is like the thought of a world without air. And he completely stripped it, turned it into his own little kingdom or multiple kingdoms. It was a confederation, but we won't go into that. Um, so in 1806, he wiped out the ancient Holy Roman Empire. Instantly, wasn't holy, wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. But that's neither here nor there. Also in 1806, he completely defeated Prussia put them under his control. So in one year, he's taken out the Holy Roman Empire and Prussia. And in the following year, in 1807, he defeated the mighty Russian bear. Uh, he smashed Russia into submission. So now the French Empire stretches from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Russian border in the east. It's vast. And he had people in place. He was a puppet master, but he had control over all of them. Vast, ancient kingdoms that had been around from the dawn of time were beaten into submission by one man from an island off the coast of France with an aim to unite Europe under France. And he did that, but in their universal hatred of Napoleon. He was a beast in the eyes of these subjugated people, and rightly so. So again, 1807, things are going rather well for old Bonaparte. He's quite happy. But then he overstretched himself. He decided in 1807 to try and take over Spain as well. And he did so, as I say, very successfully. And he made his brother Joseph uh, king of Spain. He had a bit of a tendency to put people he liked, especially his family, um, into these new royal positions. I mean, you know, he's the sort of guy you want as your big brother, right? Because when your big brother comes home from trips and he gives you a, you know, a, a, a toy or a sweet or whatever, you're sort of like, oh yeah, cheers. But when your brother's emperor of France and he turns around and goes, ah, hello, Joseph, would you like to be king of Spain? You go, oh yeah, cheers, mate. I'm really up, really up for that. But the Spanish, and as I said, everybody was unhappy with this occupation uh, mentality that Napoleon had. But the Spanish were particularly angry. Um, uh, they were very powerful, very loyal people. And they were not very happy with Boney and his brother, Joe, at all. And they just, they just kicked up such a fuss and French efforts to keep Spain calm and normal cost millions of francs, I suppose they were at the time. Um, huge amounts of money, huge amounts of men that had to be sent down to Spain in order to keep everything okay for little boy Joseph. And at this time of trouble, when the focus should have been on Spain, because the British were involved, because Portugal was being threatened and Britain was in love with Portugal, at this time that they really should have focused on consolidation, which is maintaining what you have, Napoleon made his one big blunder, big, big mistake. And he tried to take over the whole of Russia. So in 1807, when he defeated Russia, he didn't take any land from them. He just beat them into submission. And he saw that, that stuck in his mind, and he saw that as a mistake. So he made his one big blunder. He went off to go and conquer the whole of Russia. Everyone with me so far. I think Leo is having trouble with glitching. I hope everyone else is doing all right. Um, so we're now up to 1812, right? So Napoleon became emperor in 1804. He has created this vast French empire. The map of Europe was very, very single coloured at this point. The, the French blue stretched, as I say, from the Atlantic to the Russian um, the Russian border. Uh, did Napoleon have any other siblings? He did. He had several brothers and sisters indeed. Um, I won't go into that. As I say, I've tried to leave his personal life out because it's incredibly complicated. But what he did do was he used his brothers and his sisters, uh, well, not so much his sisters, but he used his brothers to, sol to solidify his power. He made them 
king, uh, kings of uh, Spain and of Italy and all these other places that he took over, because he did also take over Italy. Um, what year was the Russian takeover? Well, here we go. My heading is things fall apart, I am. Uh, it seems as though everyone's OK, so we'll plod on. So, yes, 1812. Va uh, 1812, sorry. Vast Russian um, empire. He had... Uh, hi, Jan, lovely to see you. Um, as I say, the Atlantic all the way up to the Russian border, and he decided it was time to invade Russia. Now, I beg that you listen to these numbers because they will blow your minds. And I remember learning about this at school and just thinking, my God. And then when you think that Hitler made exactly the same mistake during the Second World War, he was not a student of history. Uh, he didn't learn from anyone's mistakes. You just do not invade Russia. It really is as simple as that because the Russians are hugely uh, loyal and they have huge amounts of space to just keep pulling back, which is exactly what happened. So please get your head around these numbers because it took me a while, I have to say. Napoleon, using his uh, power, his influence and the loyalty of his army, he brought together an army of 700,000 men. He obviously knew he was on for a big job. 700,000 men were brought together for Napoleon to invade Russia, which he did in June 1812. 700,000 men made up of his personal French army and recruits from his conquered lands, all of whom were loyal, but not as loyal as the French army. 700,000 men and invaded Ju uh, Russia in June 1812. And Russia did, as I said, what they're particularly good at doing. They just pulled back and back and back. And as they did that, they burnt down... This is their own land. This is Russian land. They set fire to farms, to crops. They pulled down houses. They stole food. They put food in places where it would rot quicker. They put food in, in rivers and lakes. They killed livestock. Everything that the French could have used to keep themselves going, the Russians set fire to, shot or got rid of. And as we know, we've discussed it in the past, scorched earth. So they denied the enemy shelter and food because they literally pulled down entire villages to stop the French having anywhere where they might be able to, you know, sort of take comfort or solace or anything else like that. And the Russian forces could live off the land. They knew where they were. They knew where the food was. They would take what they wanted from these villages that they were about to burn down, take what they needed and then deny the enemy the rest of it. Genius stuff, because the French, they were being supplied over a thousand miles worth of supply. And this isn't planes and cars or anything else like that. We're talking horses and carts. I mean, the French were in a terrible position, over a thousand miles of supply. And there's no reinforcements. You can't bring reinforcements up quickly. If the Russians lost men they could just turn around into the countryside and bring in peasant soldiers. So the Russians were incredibly clever and France was in a dire, dire situation. So they weren't getting supplied, they weren't getting reinforcements and they had nowhere to rest or to sleep or to eat. And they had nothing. Terrible, terrible situation. Now remember, 700,000 men through, de through disease and desertion, Napoleon finally made it to Moscow in the winter, he started out with 700,000 men, disease, ambushes, troop desertions. Napoleon made it to Moscow with only 100,000 men. That was the rate of disaster for the French army. This huge Grand Army that was supposed to just sweep through Russia and take it over and paint it blue on the map had been reduced from 700,000 to 100,000 men. And they reached Moscow, the capital, the ancient capital of Russia. And what did they find? They found Moscow burnt to the ground. The Russians had destroyed their own capital in order to deny Napoleon 
a place to shelter and build up the strength of his army. Napoleon rode through the gates of Moscow expecting the bells to ring and people to be shouting and cheering and there was nothing. The Russian army wasn't there, they'd pulled back, the population had gone with them and Moscow was on fire. Napoleon must have felt like a complete loon um, and I'd love to say it gets better but it doesn't because Moscow was their last hope of uh, shelter and an ability to build up and because winter was coming and we've discussed, uh, very Game of Thrones that wasn't it, we've discussed, um, you know, the, uh, this is 1812 I am, the 1812 Overture as well, fantastic bit of music written to celebrate uh, Russia's um, victory over France. We've talked in the past about General Winter, the Russian winter, it's devastating, it really is. Um, and it, it devastated the German army in the Second World War. And it, by thunder, did it devastate um, Napoleon's army in 1812. Napoleon had nowhere else to go but backwards. So he turned his army back. There'd only been one battle during this entire Russian campaign. And that was the Battle of Borodino, um, where the French lost 30,000 men and the Russians lost 45. But the Russians could afford it. Um, so Napoleon had to do a complete U-turn, make a U-turn where possible. Um, and he had to retreat all the way through Russia, through the horrors of the Russian winter. Of the 700,000 men who invaded Russia in June 1812 with Napoleon riding Marengo, his horse, at the head of that phenomenal column, 700,000 when they returned to Poland in 1813, only 40,000 men remained of the Grand Army out of 700,000. It was a disaster upon, on massive levels. I mean, come on. I mean, someone out there who's much better at maths than me must be able to work out what percentage of that army went down. And if you're interested, there's a phenomenal graph online um, and it shows you how the army went up and then it reaches Moscow and then how it dwindled in numbers all the way back. 40,000 men made it back after the uh, Russian campaign. And can I say, the reason I'm grinning so broadly is I love your responses um, when I give you a little factoid like that because it just uh, it makes me feel very, very touched that people um, listen and uh, stay with me. So yes, General Winter had done his job for Russia again and Napoleon was in a terrible, terrible, terrible place. And Europe, who hated Napoleon at this point, took advantage of that. And in October 1813, a coalition, a group of Russia, Prussia, Austria, Sweden, several other smaller states, and all backed financially by Britain, they took on Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig, uh, where he was defeated roundly, uh, not surprised, he was in a terrible, terrible place. He was forced to abdicate, but an interesting fact that before this, before the Battle of Leipzig, that coalition had said to him, if you surrender and give up some of your army, we will let you stay Emperor of France. But no, he was just there going, absolutely not. I'm arrogant. I can do this. And he was defeated and he was forced to abdicate in October 1813. Who was in charge of Russia? That was Tsar Alexander I. Uh, very um, great man, actually, Alexander. So, yes, they defeated Napoleon. They forced him to abdicate and they sent him to the Isle of Elba in the Mediterranean, and that he was sent there in 1814. And that is where our story closes. Ah, no, it's not. Totally got you there, didn't I? Absolutely not. Napoleon doesn't get defeated like that. Don't be ridiculous. He's Napoleon. Napoleon the Great, smasher of Europe. Absolutely not. In one year later, in 1815, Napoleon escaped his exile on Elba. He landed in the south of France... And the king at the time, the king of France, because the monarchy had been put back in France by the British, the king sent an army, a massive army, to go and arrest one man and his small band of stragglers. Napoleon, this happened on a road called the Rue Napoleon, which you can, um, 
you can still drive down. Um, and this army went down and Napoleon was stood there with his small group of, a uh, small army behind him, hardly any men at all, about 200, I believe. And he walked towards this line of uh, this huge army that had been sent to arrest him. And he just stood there. And the army threw down their weapons and went over to Napoleon entirely. Again, a demonstration of this massive capacity he had to inspire loyalty. So this army went over and took, uh, took up arms for Napoleon. So Napoleon was now back. He wanted revenge and he had an army. This is in 1815. Izzy, I didn't know that he owned the Mona Lisa. I'm very pleased that you give me these little bits of information. I'm loving that. Fantastic. So 1815. He's emperor again, he has an army, he has a mission, and this time it's personal. It's like, you know, one of those dodgy sequel movies. Napoleon II. This time it's personal. Um, however, Napoleon had lost some of his military prowess at this time. I mean, the ability to actually win back France just by standing there. And people rallied to his cause as well. They saw that the, the new monarchy in France was entirely wrong for them. The king himself, I can't remember his name, he was a Louis, the uh, maybe a 15 or 16, uh, no, 16, 17. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, he'd actually uh, been in exile in England. So they saw him as very foreign. Um, they didn't like them very much. So Napoleon got all this power, but he lost, he lost a bit of his capabilities. And the whole of Europe was again ranged up against him. And Napoleon was roundly defeated, as we know, uh, on the 15th of July, 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, where British Prussian forces completely smashed the French army. So, the 15th of July, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo. And Napoleon, finally, after what can only be described as a valiant effort, finally gave up for good. The British uh, treated him uh, badly, even by Napoleonic standards, and he was sent into exile onto the island of St. Helena, uh, S-T, new word, Helena, H-E-L-E-N-A, St. Helena, which is in the Atlantic Ocean, a uh, horrible, bleak place, much nicer now, but at the time it was a barren wasteland, um, buffeted by Atlantic storms and very, very damp, throughout the year. Um, and finally, he died on the 5th of May, 1821. The great man, the scourge of Europe, uh, laid low, as I say, by his overambition, his, his attempts at power. Um, but there's absolutely no denying that he deserves the title Napoleon the Great, because to, in order to go from a brigadier general in 1799 to emperor of France in 1804 and to take over the entirety of Europe is quite remarkable. And I think it all hinged on one stupid mistake, and that was trying to invade Russia in 1812. A mistake, I'm sure, that he sat there on the Isle of St. Helena, twiddling his thumbs, going, damn. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not a great, not a great place. What a, it's one of those situations where um, these things don't end with a bang, but they end with a whimper. And that's certainly the case for Napoleon. At St. Helena, he became a gardener. He did. You're very, Izzy, you are obviously uh, a big Napoleon, um, uh, not fan, I suppose is the wrong word, but... Um, uh, it's very interesting. He did become a gardener. I mean, he didn't become a gardener, you know, in the same way that we know gardeners, in the respect that he didn't go around and trim other people's lawns, but he certainly got into gardening whilst he was there, I and mean, he had very little else to do. Right, the quiz, ladies and gentlemen, the quiz. Pens and paper out. Uh, why didn't he take Russia when he fought them earlier? Well, he came to an understanding with the Tsar, uh, and they basically came, they agreed that they'd just continue as they were. Um, but then Russia totally disagreed with something that Napoleon was trying to put through, which was called the Code Napoleon, a very complicated document. I specifically left it out, um, but Russia totally disagreed with that, breaking that agreement with Napoleon. So then he decided to teach them a lesson. Um, so the quiz. Question one, uh, where was Napoleon born? We seem to have quite a few experts uh, on Napoleon with us here today, so I'm sure that you're all going to absolutely smash this quiz. 
Where was Napoleon born? I know you're all going to get it. I know you are. I've given up trying to, um, to uh, you know, sort of get questions in there that perhaps you won't be able to get because you just, you're all too good for me. Okay, here we go. Let's get those answers through. We've got Izzy and Thomas coming in with Corsica. We've got Harry coming in with Corsica as well. We've got Ian saying Corsica as well. Absolutely. Well done, everybody. It was the island of Corsica. Well done, Jamie and Ethan. That's top notch from you. He was indeed. He was born on Corsica. Uh, question two. At which age did Napoleon finally learn French? Well done to the Gannies. Well done to Michelle. Well done to Mac. Congratulations, everybody. He was indeed born on Corsica. He was Corsican. Is that the right word? I'm not sure. But at which age did Napoleon finally learn French? The future Emperor of France didn't learn to speak French until he was... Harry, Jamie and Ethan, Izzy... Thomas, I am, Leo, absolutely right, he was 10 years old, well done Charlie, quite right, well done everybody indeed, well done Mishimu, yes he was 10 years old, uh, which is not great if you ask my humble opinion, um, <clears throat> now this is the one which may uh, get you out, well done Louis, top notch, um, question three, which title did Napoleon take in 1799? Now, this is perhaps the one question that may, you know, sort of throw you a bit. We'll find out. Question three. Which title did he take in 1799? Were we listening? Were we paying attention? Have I bamboozled across the board? We will find out soon. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Going to give it a few more moments just to see if anyone else launches in before I confirm or otherwise. Absolutely right, Thomas. Well done. A hundred percent. He was the first consul. Uh, well done, Ian. Uh, well done, Harry. Absolutely right. Well done, Mac. Well done, Michelle. Uh, well done, Louis. Absolutely. He was the first consul. Uh, we don't care about spelling here, but just so you know, it's C-O-N-S-U-L, consul. Um, well done, Jamie and Ethan. Well done, Harry. Absolutely. Just like the Romans. Uh, well done, Charlie. And well done, Louis. Absolutely right. He was the first consul of uh, France. Question four. Who did Napoleon have at his coronation as emperor in 1804 to validate his rule. Well done, Leo. Top notch. Have a team point. What, uh, who did Napoleon have at his coronation as emperor in 1804 to validate his rule? I know you're going to get all this one. I quite like the title, Consul. First Consul. It was rather strong. Although I don't lean towards Republican views. I'm very much more of a monarchist. So I think emperor, really, you can't really beat the title of emperor or empress, can you? Zars pretty good as well, I suppose. Uh, Harry, he would have been at his own coronation, absolutely. Um, again, Jamie and Ethan, not really what we're looking for. We were looking for, um, as Thomas has pointed out, and as Harry, uh, indeed, as has uh, Louis. Uh, absolutely. Well done, Izzy, Ian. Yes, indeed, it was the Pope, Pope Pius VII, uh, who was kidnapped. Whoever put down that they were kidnapped is 100% right. Congratulations. Um, which two things made Napoleon's army so loyal to him? Which two things made Napoleon's army so loyal to him? Well done, Michelle. Um, I'd say we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, so we get, get your answers in nice and quickly. Uh, just so you know, we are continuing with the Napoleonic theme. Um, on Friday, we're doing the Battle of Trafalgar, which is awfully exciting, 1805. We'll all thoroughly enjoy that one, I'm sure. And then on Monday, we're going to finish off with uh, the Battle of Waterloo, um, which I hope uh, we've had a lot of. We had a lot of requests for... Um, uh, a lot of requests for Napoleon himself, and we've had the request for the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Waterloo. And then after that, we can put Napoleon to bed. Um, so anyone come up there? He was an army man who came up through the ranks. Absolutely right. Well done, everybody. Well done, Leo. Well done, Jamie and Ethan. He was a soldier. He always fought with them. Absolutely right. Well done, 
everybody. Quite right. That's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, either one or both of the options. He was um, uh, he fought with them or he was one of them. Well done, everybody. Question six. Which major mistake did Napoleon make in 1812? Um, yeah, well done, Ian. He did. 60 battles that we know of uh, personally. Well done, Louis. He was a soldier. Absolutely quite right. Which major mistake did Napoleon make in 1812? Boom, 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 boom. Actually, no, I, to give you a coup. Oh, I love that piece of music. So yes, which major mistake did Napoleon make in 1812? Um, the 1812 Overture, of course, uh, written by Tchaikovsky. You can go and listen to that. Here we go. Well done, Izzy. Well done, Harry. Well done, Jamie and Ethan. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, well done, Leo. Indeed. Well done, Ian. He tried to take over Russia. Huge mistake. Um, number seven, question seven. How many men did Napoleon leave with when he invaded Russia in 1812. Well done, Thomas, and indeed his brother. Um, well done to Louis. Absolutely top notch. Or to take it over. Yep, that's fine. I mean, I, you know, absolutely well done, Mac. Indeed. You can either say to take over Russia or uh, to invade it or whatever, really. But as long as Russia's in there, you get the point. You know, if you told me, you know, cancelled his subscription at the library, I would probably have had to give you uh, a zero. Um, so yes, how many men did Napoleon leave with when he invaded Russia in 1812? Leave with, ladies and gentlemen, just to, you know, get, just let you... Uh, oh, I think we've got our numbers mixed up. How many did he leave with, as in when he went off to invade... I think perhaps... Perhaps I, could have, perhaps I could have phrased it better. How many men did Napoleon invade Russia with? But then you've actually already, you've all answered um, the next question, uh, number eight, as well as that. The uh, question seven, how many people did he go off with? 700,000 is what we were looking for. Well done to Ian and several others who got that one right. How many came back was question eight, which you all got right, which was 40,000 men. 40,000 men. 700,000 went, 40,000 came back. <clears throat> Question nine, at which battle, um, at which battle was Napoleon Bonaparte finally defeated in 1815? Well done, Mac. Absolutely right. Well done, Leo. Indeed, he went off with 700,000. He came back with 40. Um, at which battle was Napoleon finally defeated in 1815? Well done, Ian. Absolutely. All of you got a point for that, I think. But I think that was my fault. Bad, bad, Max. I asked the question in the wrong way. Leave with. I see what you were doing. You sort of saw him as leaving Russia, whereas I saw him sort of leaving to go off to, um, to go and do his thing. Well done, Ian. Indeed. Well done, Thomas, and indeed his brother. Quite right. It was indeed the Battle of Waterloo. Um, if you're interested, there's a phenomenal film out there called Waterloo, 1970s. Again, that's a really good film. You'll enjoy that. Well done, uh, Izzy. Well done, uh, Jamie and Ethan. Well done, Michelle. Well done, Harry. Um, well done to Louis and well done to Leo. Top notch. And finally, question 10. On which island did Napoleon Bonaparte die in exile in 1821? On which island did Napoleon die in exile in 18? 21. Well done, Louis. Well done, Leo. Uh, well done, Harry. I do love the use of an emoji uh, in the quiz. It does uh, sort of hammer things home. So once you've given me your answer uh, to question 10, which island did he die on? Uh, please give me all of your uh, scores, etc. Uh, I'm going to hang around for the next two minutes or so, just if anyone wants to have a quick chat, have any questions or questions about next week's um, whatever. Well done, Izzy. Well done, Michelle. Well done, Thomas, and indeed his brother. Well done, Harry. Well done, Ian. Well done, Louis. You're all blooming marvellous, you are. That's absolutely top-notch. Well done, indeed. Um, so, yes, that my dear, dear friends, uh, was Napoleon, the rise and fall of Napoleon. 
Bonaparte. Um, let me know what you think. Did you enjoy it? Um, was it up your street? Did you? Do we want more bio lessons about individuals like we've done Churchill, Julius Caesar, Napoleon now? Do we want a bio, more bio lessons or battles or run-ups or down-froms, that sort of thing? Uh, well done, Leo. Well done, Louis. Well done, everybody. That's great. The Emu War. On Monday, we're doing Waterloo, uh, Thomas, but we can definitely do the Emu War on Wednesday, perhaps. Let me do some research into that. Um, yes, let me know what, you, what, you, um, what you'd like, really, because as I say, I do work for you. Everyone seems to have enjoyed it, which is good. Toot and Carmoon, a very good option. You're more than welcome, Harry. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well done, Thomas, and indeed his brother. Um, yes, so I shall see you all on Friday um, for the Battle of Trafalgar. Well done, Jamie and Ethan. Loved that. Uh, goodbye, Mac. Lovely. Thank you for giving me a little wave. Tutankhamun from Louis. Stock market crash. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one, that one. I'll look into that. Well done, everybody. Right. Well, off I go, my dear, dear friends, as Napoleon would have said, after the age of 10. Au revoir. Before that, I don't know what the Corsican is for goodbye, but that's neither here nor there. Thank you all so much for coming um, and see you all on Friday.